The latest addition to my home lab is a full fat, three node, highly available cluster running Proxmox. Wait, didn't you just make a video about this? Yeah, but that was on some underpowered Zima boards and this is on more expensive hardware. Therefore, it's better. I'd say I'm pretty pleased with the setup, but nothing's perfect. Let's talk about it. So why? Why did I need to do this? I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I don't need this. I don't need a lot of stuff, but that hasn't really stopped me before. The real reasons I wanted this setup are because I wanted high availability for my Docker containers, and I wanted to virtualize my K3S cluster. My K3S cluster has been running on bare metal on three Intel nooks. While this has worked pretty well, it hasn't been updated since installing it because I'm afraid to break something. With a virtualized cluster, I can just take a snapshot, update it, and then roll it back when my dumbass breaks something. Neat. So along with those, I also wanted this setup to have a good amount of power, be decently power efficient, have fast networking, aka faster than one gig, and be expandable via PCIe. Well, guess what? We accomplished all of that. Let's go over the hardware. At the heart of each of these builds is a super micro X10 SDV4C, which comes with the Xeon 1521 soldered directly onto the board. This is a four core, eight thread CPU with a base clock of 2.4 gigahertz that can boost up to 2.7 and has a TDP of 45 watts. Whoa, that's it? They got chips out there with 16 cores. Yeah, duh, but I wanted a nice balance of performance, power, and price, the three Ps. I paid $250 for each of them, which I think is a decent deal. If you can find the 1531 or 1541 versions, which have six and eight cores respectively, then those could be an option if you need more horsepower. This board also has a dual 10 gigabit NIC, which will come in handy later for Ceph. For RAM, I wanted a decent amount, so each of these has 64 gigabytes of 2133 megahertz DDR4. I only use two sticks, so I could easily add another 64 gigabytes to each of these in the future if I need it, but I highly doubt that. The cost of the RAM was only $170 too, which was probably the most surprising cost of the entire build, to be honest. Okay, storage. My plan here was for each system to boot from a mirrored RAID 1 setup, so each of them has a super cheap 256 gigabyte silicon power SSD, and you can get those for like $15 each, which is awesome. It's what I would say if they weren't absolute cheeks. Here's my first mistake of the build. While yes, these things work fine as a boot drive for Proxmox, you can't do much else with them. I thought to myself, okay, 256 gigabytes, that's enough to load up some VMs and Proxmox on those two as well as be a boot drive. And it is, but these drives are so bad that running anything else on here spikes the IO delay of Proxmox all the way up. I think it's due to the SLC cache on there because once that's filled up and you're hitting the actual flash storage, game over. If I had to go back and do this all over again, I'd probably just spend a few more bucks and get some Samsung Evos or something like that. The second piece of the storage puzzle is what I'm actually gonna run everything from, meaning my K3S and Docker VMs. These boards have an NVMe slot, so clearly I went with NVMe storage, right? Wrong, kinda. My plan was to use Ceph as a highly available storage in here, which would require both speed and endurance. For that reason, I went with some two terabyte Micron 7400 Pro Enterprise SSDs. They're U.3, which uses PCIe lanes, but just a different form factor. Luckily, they have NVMe to U.3 adapters, so I snagged three of those and rigged them up. These drives are super fast, offering around 6.6 gigabytes per second reads and 3.5 gigabytes per second writes. The appeal to me, though, was the 3,500 petabytes of write endurance, and there is absolutely no way I'm ever gonna reach that, so we are good. I snagged these for $140 each, which I think was an awesome deal, and I got pretty lucky. All right, to round it all off, we need a case and power supply. Well, we killed two birds with one stone there when we snagged some in-win IWRF100 1U chassis that also come with a 315-watt power supply. Perfect. Kind of. 
The only issue I ran into here was not really an issue with the case, but the 8-pin power connector from the PSU is a single 8-pin and not two separate 4-pins, so I had issues plugging it in to the 4-pin port on the motherboard since there was a capacitor right next to it. A few 8-pin to dual 4-pin adapters fixed this though. I got these for about $160 each, which I think isn't too bad. Oh, and I guess another thing to mention is that I bought some 90 degree PCIe adapters that I was going to use to fit a PCIe card in here, but um, it, it doesn't line up with the slot on the case, so I just got some PCIe extension cables to serve this purpose. I guess you can call that mistake number two. Oops. All in for everything, not counting the adapters I bought by mistake, this build ran me around $1,900. Is that a lot of money? Yes. Is it too much money? I mean, if you don't have $1,900, yeah. For my needs, I think it's a decent price for what I'm getting. Of course, I could have done this cheaper, I know that, but I also could have spent way more. And well, um, I did spend more. In the process of replacing the heatsink and fan on one of the boards, I bricked it. I'm guessing I nicked a trace when prying off the backplate, because after installing the new heatsink, it wouldn't even get past the IPMI initialization. Yep, mistake number three. Try clearing the CMOS, flashing the BMC and BIOS, changing the RAM, and even cast a witch's spell, but that, that had other effects. So yeah, any suggestions are welcome down in the comments. And if you don't have a suggestion, you have to comment, I'm just here taking up space. You know the rules. Now, how does this setup perform? Honestly, pretty great. Granted, I haven't put it through its paces yet. It's done everything I asked of it. I set it up as a Proxmox cluster, which is an easy process in itself. From there, I set up Ceph, which will provide me with high availability storage for the entire cluster. I'm not even going to pretend to be some Ceph expert or even competent for that matter, but I know the basics and how to press a button to get it set up, which is enough for me. Since this is going to be my production cluster moving forward, I'm sure I'll pick up some knowledge along the way, but for now, I'm a noob. What I do know is that it provides me with highly available storage so my services can fail over to any of the nodes and that it works best on faster networking. This is why I was adamant about having 10 gig networking on these nodes. Since each machine has two 10 gig ports, we've dedicated an entire one just for the Ceph network, and even went one step further and gave it its own switch. I picked up a Unify Flex XG, which is a four port 10 gigabit switch, and the only clients I have plugged into there are the nodes with their Ceph network. This isn't required, but every forum post I saw basically crucified anyone who didn't have a dedicated Ceph network, so I didn't want to end up getting cyberbullied by some neckbeard. At $300, I think it's a pretty decent option, so go ahead and throw that into the total cost. With Ceph up and running, everything was working as expected. My two terabytes of storage was showing up in each host, and every VM could be easily failed over to each node. To have the cluster automatically recover the VM on a node failure, you'll simply mark it as HA in Proxmox. I went a step further and created HA groups, which lets me specify which node I'd like to be the primary for each VM. This allows me to ensure by default, there's a single K3S VM running on each node. Then if that fails, it will pick one of the other two to spin it back up. The cool part is that when the original node is back up, it will throw it back on there since that one is primary based on the HA group. Cool stuff. Oh, and when you do this, the higher number in the group is the more primary. I initially assumed the opposite where zero would be used before one and so on, but no, it's, it's the opposite. Two other things I need to mention about the whole setup. One is that 10 gigabit NICs on here only work in one or 10 gigabit mode. I initially planned on hooking up the other 10 gigabit NIC to my 2.5 gig switch to get 2.5 gig networking to the Proxmox hosts, but that's not supported. For my use case, it's not really a problem, but it's definitely something to note. The other thing is that I could not for the life of me get GPU pass through working on these machines. Before you link me a guide you found on the first page of your Google search, just know that I tried it. I spent days tinkering around with different VM settings, host settings, BIOS settings, 
Different cars, different operating systems, nothing would work. I got the famous code 43 driver error, which is absolutely annoying as f I don't really need a GPU, I was just throwing stuff in there to mess around. As of right now, the PCIe slots are vacant and ready to have a nice PCIe card inserted right inside it. Let me know what you'd put in there, and um, don't say you're dead. Subscribe. Okay, overall thoughts here. I'm happy with this new setup. Is it perfect? Nah. Could be a bit more powerful, could have spent less, could be easier to pass a GPU through, sure but none of that stuff is even close to a deal breaker for me. I bought this setup to be a power efficient, highly available cluster for me to run my production Docker and K3S cluster on. At 100 watts total for all three machines, I am extremely pleased. No, it's not gonna win any benchmarking drag races, but I don't need that. I still have my Epic system if I wanna run anything resource intensive. If I had to do all of this over again, there are a few things I'd changed. Those silicon power drives just suck. If you do this or anything with SSDs, just spend like 10 more dollars and get a Samsung or a Crucial MX drive. Also, I did see some 1531 machines for just a bit more money on eBay that included a chassis and RAM, so maybe I would have gone with those. I, I don't know, maybe not. Other than that though, this is an awesome setup. I know it isn't a super deep dive into everything, but that will come with using it for a bit. Once this setup has a few decades under its belt, then maybe I'll be comfortable enough with Ceph to come back and teach you guys some stuff, but for now, that's all I got. If you like this video, then be sure to drop a like. If you like seeing a dude spend too much money on stuff that he doesn't need, then subscribe, because you'll, you'll see a lot of that. I wanna give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my Ceph cluster, AKA my certified Easter party hat. If you're still watching, I appreciate it. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one.